Well, welcome to 2023, another year in the seemingly endless ticking clock of humanity, who's ready to stumble around for another year collectively on this rock, who's ready for another orbit of the sun. I'm ready. Anyway, we're going to be doing the force energy question this is a rather large question with a rather large amount of theory which i will run through in a second but don't ever say i don't work really hard for you guys because man put some serious effort into this it's 64 pages long we have the theory which i said i'll go through and then we have all of these questions i've meticulously extracted these questions and organized them all for you and i've answered all of them you have like 60 pages of answers written for you here. Yeah, and they're all correct. I checked all of them. And so don't ever be complaining that your boy doesn't work hard. This took me ages. So download that and go through it. And you'll get a feel for this question. Because they like to change the appearance of this question. But they're asking on the same stuff every time. But yeah. So let's jump into the theory. So basically in this video we're going to be looking at force, force, work, energy, power, these kind of concepts, these kind of ideas. Uh, those are very big ideas we'll be looking at in, in the classical sense here, so we're just regular objects, but they, obviously these ideas trickle through all of physics. They permeate through physics. They come up in electromagnetism and electricity and basically everything. Force and energy, a, these are big boy concepts. Uh, so we've got this theory here now look you have the internet and your teachers you know they they get like weeks and weeks to teach you this stuff and i'm going to try and just quickly go through it in five minutes uh, but i've got all the theory it's all cut down and organized for you it's all you need to know to answer these questions but you have the internet so if there's something you don't understand you can use the internet you know what is newton's laws look it up read about it and I'm going to go through all of it. So first of all, let's look at forces. So Newton's laws of motion. It's basically three, three laws which describe the laws of motion in terms of forces. So number one is a body remains in rest or is at constant speed unless it's acted upon by force. So unless you act upon, uh, a force is acted upon a body, it will remain at rest or at speed. Second one is, you know, when, it, when a body is acted upon a force, you know, basically F equals MA. So the sum of the forces, so the, all the forces acting on this object, equals mass times acceleration, the net acceleration. We'll do a question on that. And finally, the if two bodies exert forces on each other, you know they have the same magnitude but opposite directions. So acting on each other, well, my right hand has a force equal to my left hand, or you know, but in the opposite direction. So they're equal magnitude but opposite. The weight of an object, this is mass times gravity. So it's just the basically the force due to gravity on an object. So it's the weight of an object. You also need to know force inclined geometry. So how is the weight uh, distributed down an inclined slope? And this is how it's distributed. And you can work out these components. We're, we're going to do questions on all of this. You understand all of this. Uh, I've picked out really good questions here. You also need to know about terminal velocity. Basically, terminal velocity is just uh, the maximum velocity experienced by an object in free fall or when it's experiencing an air resistance. So at the start of its fall, the weight will be greater than its air resistance, so it'll be accelerating. But eventually, as it speeds up, the air resistance is going to get greater and greater and greater to the point where the weight and the air resistance are the same. And at that point, it's not accelerating and it's at maximum uh, velocity. And that velocity is called terminal velocity. So it's not accelerating, it's a, it's a flat line on the VT graph. Now let's talk about work and energy. Work done, like I said, it's a lot of information. So work done is basically the force times um, displacement. So it's equal to the force multiplied by the distance move in the direction of that force. This could be positive or negative. You could have work done by a force or work done against a force, depending on whether we're acting in the direction of the displacement or the force is acting opposite to the direction of the displacement. We also have the principle of conservation of energy, which basically says energy can't be created or destroyed. So it's either tra it's basically transformed from one form to another. A big thing in these examples is, you know, gravitational potential energy going to kinetic energy and work done against some resistive force. Again, questions will be done on all of this. 
you have kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy. Kinetic energy is the energy possessed by object in motion. I've described this before, uh, both of these before in kinematics. And gravitational potential energy is energy possessed, uh, possessed by an object due to its position in a gravitational field. Okay, and finally, we'll talk about power. What is power? Power is basically just the work, uh, rate of doing work. So as we saw before, work done is just force times displacement. And power is equal to work done uh, divided by time. It's the rate of doing work. So work divided by time. And from that, you can actually derive this other equation for power, which is a very useful equation, which is the force uh, times the velocity. So the force here being a driving force. So I've got a proof here. So some driving force. So some, let's say an engine is producing some driving force, which is moving uh, this uh, car at a velocity. Well, the power then can be calculated by that driving force times the velocity that the, uh, the car is then moving at. And a little note on efficiency. So, you know, things can be efficient or inefficient to certain percentages. And we can use the efficiency calculations to you know, calculate the actual output of a motor or something or, a, you know, a human or whatever or energy output or something like this. It's pretty easy to calculate that stuff. Okay, so that's all the theory. Like I said, I went through it quickly. I don't have a lot of time. So, you know, if you don't know about the stuff, either ask me in the comments or, you know, use the internet. The internet is a pretty powerful resource, man. So use the internet, but you've got all the key theory there. And so let's just jump into some questions now. Okay, so to really consolidate all that information, which was a lot, I will admit, uh, we're going to do questions. We've got recent questions from 2021 and 2022. I've picked these purposely uh, so we can get a real good feel. Yeah. Okay, so we have a person who uses a trolley to move a suitcase at an airport. The total mass of the trolley and suitcase is 72 kilograms. Uh, the person pushes the trolley and suitcase along a horizontal surface with a constant speed of 1.4 meters per second and then releases the trolley. The trolley uh, then moves in a straight line and comes to rest. Assume that the constant total resistive force, so we have this trolley that's moving, it has a resistive force, call it F mu, of 18 newtons. It's moving along some horizontal, but it's got a constant resistive force, which is actually the reason why it's deaccelerating its motion and coming to rest. Calculate the power required to overcome this resistive force um, when it's moving at speed. Well, we know that power equals F V. And so the driving force in this case will, to overcome this resistive, resistive force will be that resistive force. Right? To overcome that, we need a equal and opposite force. So it'd be, this would be, in this case, the driving force will be F mu. And our V is 1.4. So this is going to be 18 times 1.4. Gene times 1.4, which is 25.2. Going to try and go a little faster because I want to don't want to make this too long. So this is 25 watts. So round it. So we always round to two significant figures for some reason in this paper. I don't know why they do that, but they do that. Not very accurate, I must say. Uh, calculate the time taken for the trolley to come to rest after it's released. Okay, well, as I said before, this force, this frictional force is deaccelerating it. So let's figure out how much it's deaccelerating it by. But, you know, because we have an initial speed V, right, at 1.4 meters per second. And we have a final speed 0 meters per second, right, because it comes to rest. We have an acceleration or deacceleration, which we don't know. How do we find that deacceleration? Well, for all of these, we use this. So the net... Well, the net force on this object is the sum of all the forces. In this case, there's only one force. Because the sum of all the forces is only one force acting on this thing, which is that resistive force. So, you know, but it's acting in the negative direction, so it's going to be minus F mu net. And minus F mu, well, this is just minus our 18. Minus 18, and the mass is 72 kilograms times the net acceleration. So the acceleration net on this object which will be negative negative 18 to whatever 72 it's minus 0 0.25 minus 0 0.25 so minus 0 0.25 makes sense that it's minus right because it's deaccelerating okay so 
Cool. What's an equation now we can find the time it takes to get to rest? Well, V equals U plus AT. V, final, is zero. U, initial, is 1.4. This is zero. This is 1.4. And this is minus 0 0.25 T. Okay, so take that over. We get 0 0.25 T equals 1.4. So T equals... 1.4 divided by 0 0.25, which is 5.6 seconds. And this comes up a lot, doing this, finding this acceleration through forces. And then using kinematics to figure out some shit. <laughs> okay, at another place in the airport, the trolley and the suitcase are on a slope. Okay, so we still have this resistive force, but now we have this force F, 54 newtons. So the trolley is released from rest, so at the start it's, again, it's at 0 meters per second. It's, uh, the trolley moves down the slope, 9.5 meters is seen from x to y. The f command is the weight down the slope. So this 54 newtons here represents the weight of the trolley acting down the slope. Um, I assume that there's a constant resistance like before, so calculate the speed of the trolley at point y. Well, again, to find the speed of the trolley at point Y, we're going to need the acceleration down the slope. What is the acceleration down the slope? Well, some of the forces, we want the net acceleration on this object equals the mass times the acceleration, net acceleration. What is the sum of the forces? Well, in this case, we have you know, the positive weight acting down the slope, which they call F, minus this resistive force, which is F mu. Right. Equals the mass times acceleration. Right. And this is 54 this is 18 right because they're minus because they're acting in different directions so the resultant force will actually be you know in this direction the mass was 72 right yeah okay so therefore we rearrange that we get the net acceleration this object down the slope will be 54 minus 18 divided right by 72 so ah, it's a promising number Okay, so we have acceleration down the slope. We have the initial, uh, what do we want? We want the speed, so we want the final. We have the displacement, this is equal to this. We have u equals zero meters per second. V we want to find. We have s equals 9.5 meters, and this is now, so now it's just kinematics. Acceleration is 0 0.5 meters per second squared. And what else do we have? That's it, right? V we want to find. So we can just use V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. U. We want to find V. U. This is 0. So this is 0. 2. A is 0 0.5. And S is 9.5. Right, that's just a kinematic equation. Watch my video on kinematics. That's going to be... 2 times 0 0.5 times 9.5 uh, square root answer so that just equals uh, 3 point so you square root this and you get 3.08 meters per second but you round again to two significant figures it's 3.1 3.1 calculate the work done by the force F the movement of the trolley well work equals force times displacement which is a little on the theory well with this force f the work done by this force which is 54 and the displacement is 9.5 so the work done is 54 times 9.5 which gives 513 however we round that to two significant figures so it'd be 5 10. Okay, the trolley is released, t equals zero, sketch the graph, so the variation of in time t, for the work done by f. Uh, okay, so how is the work done changing as time progresses? Well, it's obviously going to be increasing, right? But it's not going to be increasing just linearly, like straight line, because as it speeds up, so as it, as it moves down, it speeds up. So its velocity is increasing. 
And so as this velocity is increasing, that means the distance it travels is also increasing. So it's almost like an exponential increase. And so it's going to be the work done is going to basically increase kind of exponentially. Like let's say like that. It's going to get, it's going to slope up. It's going to increase because it's speeding up. If it's speeding up, then it's moving a, you know, a lot further distance in the same amount of time, which means that the change in distance is going to be greater in the same amount of time, which means the work done is going to be greater in the same amount of time as time progresses. Right? The angle of the slope is constant. The frictional force is acting on the wheels. Also constantly explaining practice. It is incorrect to assume the total resistance force opposing the motion in the suitcase is constant as trolley moves. Well, in actuality, there'll be a an air resistance force Right, opposing the motion of the trolley and this force will increase as uh, you know we speed up this object speeds up I guess you just say that right same way in practice this increase assume the total resistance yeah so you know the total resistive force will actually increase as we progress down the slope because we're speeding up and so the air resistive force will get bigger and bigger and so the total resistive force will get bigger and bigger cool let's continue so i've got three questions here so hopefully that's sufficient they're all different they're all from very recent years a child of weight 330 newtons remember weight is mg uh so at point X and slides down to the edge of a swimming pool. So child's having a bunch of fun here. Sliding away. I used to love sliding. Can't do that as an adult. What a shame. Maybe I can. Fuck it. The child moves from rest. So it's at rest here. And so basically just describing this diagram. Also says here that it has a kinetic energy, so it's kinetic energy at Y is 540 joules. Probably going to be important. Calculate the difference in gravitational potential energy of the child between points X and Y. Well, change in G equals to half mg, not half. What are you on about? mg change in H. It's on the worksheet. Sometimes I might label these things differently. This is... I mean the change in gravitational potential energy. Well, is mass times gravity is his weight, so it's 330. What is the change in height? Well, he goes from at x, he's at 4, and then at y, he's at 1.1. The change in height is 4 minus 1.1. So this equals 2. 4 minus 1.1 times 330 is 957. Rounded will be 960. An average frictional force is acting on the child uh, by considering the changes in to determine the distance moved by the child. Okay, well, let's think about what's happening here. Remember, he has a kinetic energy here of 540. This, this concept comes up all the time. We have a gravitational potential energy, a change in gravitational potential, and this is going to kinetic energy. It's being transformed into kinetic energy and also being used up by the work against the frictional force. So against the resistive force, I guess we could say. So we have we have all of our gravitational potential energy, and now it's moving. By speeding the child up, it's transforming into kinetic energy and also being used up to overcome the resistive force on the slide, which is acting upon it. You know, we can say this equals this. And so, you know, this means that remember the work done by the resistive force, the force, the resistive force which they give us, and the distance move. We want the distance move. So we can find it. So we can say, you know, WR, the work done by the resistive force, is going to equal to change in G minus change in K. This is a concept that comes up all the time. Okay, well, change in G, difference in gravitational potential, is 960. The change in K, well, he starts at rest and then finishes at 540. It's going to be just 540 then. WR, well, this is FRS, right? Force times displacement the formula for work done that will that's just 52 s 52 s 
So therefore we get S equals well, 960 minus 440, uh, 540 sorry, divided by 52. So 8.07, which is rounded is 8.1 meters. Right? This makes sense, right? He has only gravitational potential energy here. Is then changing into kinetic energy and also being used up to overcome this resistive resistive force. If there was no resistive force, then it would just be a complete transformation from gravitational potential energy to kinetic. Child then leaves the slide at point Y. Okay, so it gets to y. Uh, point z is the highest point. Calculate the speed of the child at point y. Well, we know that you know it's kinetic energy. The child's kinetic energy that is well, 540, 540 joules at this point, and kinetic energy equals to a half m v squared. The weight of the child it sounds so funny to me to say child. The weight of the child is 330 newtons. Okay, so, you know, weight, 30 newtons. This equals W equals mg. His mass will be, you know, his weight over gravity. So 330 over 9.81. Just doing that because I know we have to plug it in here. So if you want the speed, well, therefore we get 540 equals to a half times its mass, which is 330 over 9.81. I just found from its weight, just dividing uh, by 9.81 uh, times v squared. Okay, so I 40 times 2 times 9.81. So I'm just rearranging this on my calculator. So you get v squared equals, and before we get v squared equals 32. Look at that beautiful 3, 32.1. So square root that, we get uh, 5 rounded, we get. V equals 5.7 meters per second. 5.7. And it wants the speed of Z. Well, as we saw in kinematics, speed of Z, all of its speed will be the horizontal component here. I have no component acting in the vertical. So if we just find the horizontal component, that will be its speed at V. You know, this is V, this is VX. This angle here is 41 degrees, so VX cause opposite adjacent cause of 41 degrees equals 2v over vx so therefore uh, no not v over vx vx over v so therefore vx equals to v cause of 41 degrees and this is 5.7 <laughs> squeeze it in look at that uh times cos of 41. So I rounded this as 4.3. Right, because the horizontal component at y is 4.3 meters per second. So therefore all of its speed, as all of its speed will be its horizontal component as z, well, therefore, its speed is this horizontal component, so it will be 4.3 meters per second. Okay, one more from 2022, and then we're done. Wide variety of questions. Define power. Well, power, like I said before, the rate of doing work. Or you know, work done divided by time. Force F takes T. To move displacement x, constant velocity, blah, blah, blah. So basically derive this. Well, as we just said up there, power is work divided by time. Well, what is work? Work is force times displacement. Displacement is x here. Divided by time, well, it's just force times x over t. This displacement over time is velocity. There you go. Power equals f and v. A block is pulled up a slope and attached by a wire. The useful power output, so the useful, so what is used, what is actually useful is 56 watts. Um, the weight of the block is 430, and it moves with a constant velocity up the slope of 11 degrees. Calculate the tension in the wire. Well, there's no resistive forces, so the tension in the wire will equal to the weight acting down the slope. 
And I guess if you want to show that, again, it comes down to this thing's a very important equation. Some of the forces can equal to the net acceleration. In this case, moving at a constant velocity. So the net acceleration of the block is zero. That means this thing equals zero. And what are the forces? Well, we have the tension, which will be acting up, minus the weight of the slope, weight of the block down the slope. We'll call it Wx, you know, because we'll have this. It's 11 degrees. This is Wx, Wy. This is on the worksheet. It's the actual weight equals zero. And therefore, T equals the weight down the slope. Therefore, the tension equals what is the weight down the slope? Well, we have opposite over hypotenuse. So we get sine of 11 degrees equals opposite, which is Wx over hypotenuse, which is W. Therefore, Wx equals to this. So therefore, the tension equals to W sine of 11 degrees and w the weight of the block is 430 maybe going a little fast but quite a little material here don't know how fast to go the fine line i'm playing with here so if you plug that you get the tension and that's 82 82 newtons calculate the speed of the block Oh, power equals V. Well, the power of the motor is 52 and is producing a force, which is the tension, right? Because it, to pull this block up, this force will just be the tension, the driving force of the motor, which is just the tension in this case. Uh, so therefore, V will equal the power over the tension. Tension is the driving force of this motor. Okay, so that's going to be 56 divided by 82. So 0.68 rounded, so 0.68 meters per second. The rate of increase of gravitational potential energy of the block. Da, da, da. One of the reasons for that is the... One of the reasons for this is that there's no work done against resistant force. By considering the motion of the block state, another reason for this. Okay, it's equal to the useful power alpha. Uh, okay, well, another reason for this is that uh, there's no, well, there's no chain. What is it saying? The rate of increase in gravitational energy block is equal to the useful power. Well, okay, well, another reason for this is because, because it's moving at constant velocity, there's no change in kinetic energy either. So another reason for this would be that there's no, so I guess say constant uh, velocity. Uh, so no change, no change in kinetic energy. No, there's no change in kinetic energy. That's another reason why. Uh, the motor has an efficiency of 80%. Can calculate the time taken for an input energy. Okay, so the input energy energy doing the work so yeah we want the time taken remember power is work done over time therefore time is equal to uh, work over power okay so the energy the energy producing the work is 1.2 kilo kilojoules okay that's the input energy but it has an efficiency of 80 percent so the actual useful work or energy here i guess we'll say the use or uh energy or work from the motor is going to be 0 0.8 times 1200 which is what 0 0.8 times 1200 960 960 joules okay that'd be 960 divided by the useful power the useful power output which is 56 this is, this is the useful power output and also the useful energy or the useful work produced by this energy, engine. So 960 divided by 56. So 17 seconds, I guess. The rounded, this is 17 seconds. Cool. So that's three really good questions. I might have gone a little fast, but I 
explained as much as possible. There's good examples there. They ask us all every single year. Um, but although the appearance of the question changes, what they're asking on is the same. So hopefully that was useful. Now we're going to uh, talk about observation and how to uh, really actually do physics in real time. We're going to do an exercise. I want you to notice that you're not actually doing any physics. What is physics? Physics, very simply put, is the act of observing, acute, meticulous observation. And so you're not actually doing any physics. You're just learning uh, the physics that has been done by others. And so let's actually do some physics. Let's learn how to do physics. How do we observe? I want to teach you here that observation is learning. Deep observation of something that is learning. If you observe something without thinking about it, just purely observing it, you will learn something about it. You will know something about it, which you can't systemize. You can't express. There's something you just know about it. And this all comes from deep observation, pure, clear observation. And so your mind and body, this thing that you have in your possession is the best apparatus in the universe for observing and understanding reality. That's the case I'm making. Pretty bold claim, but I believe it's true. I mean, I know it's true. And so let's say if we wanted to learn or observe or understand gravity or force, well, what we would do is we'd simply relax our body, our mind, we'd calm our mind, we'd slow down our breathing, and we would observe and make relevant in our experience the feeling of gravity, the force. Close your eyes, maybe, and you'd feel gravity, the force of gravity, and your mind will wander, it will go off, you basically keep coming back, you keep coming back, and you feel this force. And I'm basically saying to you that if you do that, you will learn about it in a, in a different way that you've been learning for all of this, all of the other other side of your education. By doing this deep observation, you will know something about it which can't be taught to you. And this is a very powerful technique. So you calm yourself down and you observe. You try and remove yourself from the observation. Don't think about it. Don't put yourself onto it. What do I really mean by that? Don't, don't put your own agenda onto the experience that you're having of gravity, the phenomenon of gravity. Don't place yourself onto that. It's going to taint your experience. Don't think of like, how is this useful to you? Don't think like that. Don't, don't observe it for a purpose. Observe it to learn about it. You can do this with anything you want in life. If you want to learn about something, observe it. If you want to learn about anything, simply observe it. It's a powerful, powerful technique, and this is not the way they teach you. So to make it clear, observation is learning. To observe is to learn. It's a very powerful thing I'm saying to you, and I hope, I hope it lands. I really hope it does, because if this is a transform transformative um, sort of practice that you can use to understand things around you. Okay, that's it. Uh, hopefully you do enjoy and uh, observed and learnt in this video. Make sure you like, subscribe, and if you're in need of any A2 content, all of that is on either Vimeo or Patreon. Much love and I'll see you when I see you.